are sports oriented, love to see a comeback. When it seems that a team or athlete is down and out or way behind, it is exciting to see them come out of nowhere and turn things around. Amen. What appeared at first to be an inevitable defeat is now an awesome victory. My hope for you is simply this. After hearing this sermon, no matter what situation or circumstances you find yourself in, that you will be much better prepared to make a comeback. Amen. Amen. Now, recording, recording devices are equipped with a reverse button where you can rewind and, and, and sort of go back. Some of us wish that life was like that. Where we were, where um, we could just push that button and, and go back, go way back to where we made bad decisions, where we made critical mistakes, wishing we can replay life all over again. Problem is, though, life is not like that. And time doesn't work that way. You can never go back to yesterday. Yesterday is gone and gone forever. But there is good news, you see. For whereas you may not be able to go back, you can come back. By that I mean, maybe right now you are having to deal with the consequences of your past mistakes. But that does not necessarily determine how it will all end for you. You see? Because every setback is a setup for a comeback. You understand that? Every setup is a every setback is a setup for a comeback. Amen. We all have issues. We've made bad decisions and bad mistakes. There are biblical examples of people who have made a comeback, particularly from the negative consequences of choices they made, or maybe choices forced upon them of which they had no control. Nevertheless, there is good news, and there is hope. There is a merciful, forgiving, and understanding God who looks beyond your mistakes and sees instead your potential. Amen. A God who, who, who gives us more chances than we deserve. A God who says, if you will trust and obey me, I will turn your darkness into light and your setbacks into comebacks. There are some people who actually believe they're cursed. And maybe they are because of their lifestyle. Some of you sitting here probably know someone whose life is spinning out of control, or maybe, or maybe that someone is you. Nothing seems to be going right. Everything is messed up. The situation is going or has gone from bad to worse, and you begin to wonder, what else can go wrong? Hmm? Just when it seems you have a breakthrough, comes another fumble. Hmm? Another interception. Something else just knocks you down again. It seems you just can't catch a break. Hmm? 
Somebody read uh, Mark chapter 5, 1 and 2 for me, please. But before we do that, let me just say this. I, I mentioned just now that um, sometimes it seems you can't catch a break. That they're, they're, uh, every time you think you, 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 you have a breakthrough, there was a fumble, another interception, and that something else just knocks you down again. And I'm sure some of you here know exactly what I'm talking about. I know someone who's been going through this. But today we will focus on, we will focus on the comeback. In other words, coming back from your setbacks and discovering how to get a comeback in your own life. Or maybe help someone else to reverse their life from its present course. This includes, of course, the money control that you or someone you know just might be on. Mark 5, 1 and 2. Someone read that for me, please. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he, and when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. So they arrived at the other side of the lake, in the land of the Gerasenes. Just as Jesus was climbing from a boat, huh? A man possessed by an evil spirit ran from a cemetery to meet him. And so we find here that Jesus and his disciples have just crossed over the lake and they're getting out of this boat when they were met with a, what appeared to be a being from hell. It was a sight more terrible than the raging storm Jesus had just come in Mark 4. Somewhere from among the hiding places in the tombs of a nearby cemetery, a madman possessed by an evil spirit rushed towards them as if to tear them to pieces. Now the description of this man is quite intense. Verses 3 and 5 somewhere. Mark chapter 5, verses 3 and 5. Who had his dwelling among the two? Oh, actually, verses, verses 3 through 5. Yes. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, Neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. Mm. Mm. So this man lived among the tombs and could no longer be restrained, not even with chains. Mm. Whenever he was put into chains and shackles, as he often was, he snapped the chains from his wrist and smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him. And day and night he wandered among the tombs and in the hills, howling and, and, and cutting himself with sharp stones. And said, when you read the story, when you read the same story in Luke chapter 8, verse 27, the man walked around naked, according to Luke, to Luke 8. Well, at least we know from this story that that man is not all there. He's not all there. The elevator just does not go all the way to the top of the sky. Let's get real. The man is stark, raving mad. He has lost his mind. Let me tell you something. If you are living in a cemetery, you are living among dead folks. Since you don't know how to hang out with the living, something's got to be wrong with you. Parts of the broken chains were still attached to this guy. It's hanging from his body. He was bleeding all over from self-inflicted wounds. His hair was long and tangled. He had eyes that glared as though humanity itself was replaced by the evil spirits that possess him. He foamed at the mouth. 
He growled and bared his teeth like an animal. His fingernails and toenails were like claws, and he looked more like a wild beast than a man. This man could have been a star in the movie Night of the Living Dead. He was the terror of the neighborhood. No one was safe in the immediate area where he was. He would pounce on them with the fury of the evil spirits that controlled him. So let's accumulate this. The man was uncontrollable and a social outcast. Chains couldn't hold him. People couldn't hold him. He's hanging out with dead people. He is self-mutilating by cutting himself with sharp stones. And his situation is going from bad to worse. Society did what, did what they could by putting him in restraints. But it was just a temporary fix to a much deeper problem. He wasn't just having a bad year day, or a bad week, or a bad month. This was everyday life for, 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 for this man. This was ongoing. This was continuous day and night. It was his lifestyle. If you saw this guy walking on the street, acting out and naked, naked as he was, you'd probably say, hey, bring the wagon. He's mean looking and, and, and acting crazy. Nobody wants to be around him. Something, you know, is definitely wrong with this man. Now, there's no mention in the Bible as to what caused his problem. But verse 2 tells us he was controlled by evil spirits. In other words, the man was acting out externally because of what was wrong with him internally. He was demon-possessed and demonic controlled. He was under demonic influence. Now, if you had to just look at this guy, you'd probably conclude that he should be locked away in an insane asylum. But we are told that this man's problem was demons controlled his activities. Something in, this, in his life opened the portal for demonic infiltration. Let's talk a little about that. Let's talk a little about the characteristics and activities of demon. Lucifer, now of course the devil or Satan, and his demons, who are also referred to as fallen angels, or unclean or evil spirits, they are invisible beings, originated from heaven where they once served around the throne of God. But they joined Satan in his rebellion against God and were eventually cast out of heaven. Demons are ruled by Satan. He and his angel followers have a systematic and well-developed doctrine of their own. And that is to lead people into immorality, idolatry, addictions, and other types of evil and wickedness. They have terrible destructive powers. And they can, they can inflict diseases. They can also cause a person to become mute, deaf, blind, and insane. They will make every attempt to distort, frustrate, and destroy God's purposes in your life. They can possess the bodies of humans and animals. Demons extend the authority of Satan by doing his bidding. And will set you up to commit sin. They oppose the spiritual growth of God's children and they will mix the truth with a lie. Which means, if you don't know your Bible, you will be deceived into believing and accepting false doctrine. Demon's ultimate goal is to make sure you don't make it into God's kingdom. They will rob you of that privilege because, you see, Satan and his demons don't have a thing to lose. They have nothing to lose. They know their destiny is hell's fire. And they will take as many of you with them that have not surrendered to the Lord. 
They will destroy you by any means necessary. Now if you notice, the demon mentioned here is referred to as an unclean spirit. Same as an evil spirit as written in some, in some uh, translations. Why is it called an unclean spirit? Well, I'll tell you why. Demons are attracted to uncleanness. You understand me? They are attracted to uncleanness. Put them out of the way. Just as good angels follow cleanness and righteousness, Bad angels follow unrighteousness and uncleanness. Do you understand that? So the reason for this man's demon possession was that something in his life attracted demons. What I want you to understand is this, though. Demon possession doesn't just happen. Okay? It comes by invitation. That's right. It comes by invitation. By that I mean demons look for any opportunity to inhabit your life and your home. And some of you sitting here today unknowingly, just by your very conduct and lifestyle, give them that opportunity. Do you understand that? If your lifestyle is not in harmony with the will of God, it is an invitation for demonic infiltration and habitation. Let me see if I can help you understand what I'm saying. I want you to follow the logic here. Follow the logic here very closely. If you allow water to remain standing for a period of time, especially during the summer, you will attract mosquitoes. Isn't that right? It's a nice environment for them because, you see, they are home in stagnant water. Follow the logic. If your garbage sits out for an extended period of time, guess who you will, guess who you will attract? You will attract a rat and his cousins. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Do you understand that? Because you have created a convenient environment for them to be at home. That's right. If you allow food and dirty dishes to sit too long in your home, you will attract roaches. They will perceive that you gave them an invitation by making a connection with the environment you created. So guess who's coming to dinner? In other words, whatever or wherever uncleanness exists, it is an invitation for demons to hang out. Do you understand that? Yes. That's all the invitation they need. But don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that, I'm not implying that every person who is mentally challenged is demon possessed. No, no, no. However, many mentally challenged people could be just that, mentally challenged. While others who appear to be mentally challenged could very well be demon possessed. Which is why medical treatment is not the answer for demon possession because medicine cannot cure the problem. This is a spiritual problem and you cannot treat spiritual problems with medicine. So unless you can detect the root of the problem, you won't know what the problem is. Now, under normal condi conditions, when you're faced with a physical ailment, you will go to the drugstore, you'll get some over-the-counter meds, you'll follow other people's advice, and you'll treat the problem. You may feel better for a while, but then the thing comes right back. Hmm? 
It does not go away. Maybe it's because you are not addressing the cause, just the same thing. Which is why it still persists. Anybody who saw this man will conclude he is a deranged, crazed lunatic who needs to be in a mental institution. But because God takes us behind the scenes, you see, we have added information and we are more aware of his situation. And that is, the man has lost control of his mind and he is situated in an environment of uncleanness that has caused the money consequences to control his life. This man's problem could not be helped by society. His issue was not physical. His issue was spiritual. And no one took the time to address the real cause of his problem. All they were trying to do was to keep him from acting like a fool by putting him in chains. They were not getting to the root of the problem that was causing his behavior. So I'm suggesting to you that some of the, of the uh, behavioral conditions we categorize as crazy are not necessarily because of a mental breakdown, even though sometimes it could be. It could also be demonic infiltration caused by an, an, an environment created by the individual's lifestyle. But you see, if you don't know, if you don't know that, all you will see is aberrant behavior and not the spiritual condition. That's right. So here we have a man who has lost his mind because of demon possession. Jesus shows up and something very interesting happens. Verses 6 through 8, somebody. Mark 5, verses 6 through 8. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice, and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God, that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. Come on to Listen. <laughs> and now 6 to 8. When Jesus was still some distance away, the man saw him, ran to him, and what? Bowed before him. And with a shriek, he screamed, Why are you interfering with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In the name of God, I beg you, don't torture me. Now, I had to read those two verses because I hope you get what you just heard. The man saw Jesus from a distance. He runs toward Jesus and he bows. Now let's stop right there. Let's stop right there. The last time I checked, bowing is a form of worship. Huh? If you go to Jesus and pay homage to him by bowing, that's a pastor of worship. This man runs up to Jesus and in a posture of worship, bow down. But after bowing to Jesus, he screams, why are you bothering me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now, listen to this. That question right there doesn't fit that act. That question does not fit that act. He runs to Jesus he bows down, but after bowing, he says, why are you bothering me? Why am I here? Now, you just ran to him. You bow to him, and you're asking, why is he bothering you? When you're the one who ran to him? You must be crazy. I hope you saw something in verse 7, because it says with a shriek, he scream, why are you interfering with me, Jesus? Don't torture me. What? Don't torture me? Since when does Jesus torture anyone? What's really going on here with this guy anyway? The man runs to Jesus, he bows down. So we call that a good thing. That's a good thing, right? But a good thing with bad results. Because he says, 
I'm tortured by this trip. I took a trip and came into your presence, but things got worse. Don't torture me. Why would he say something like that? In verse 8, Jesus told the evil spirit to come out of the man. So now we know why the man feels he's being tortured. You see, what has happened here is the godly has met the ungodly. You get it? Good has met evil. The demons are now in the presence of Jesus and they are very upset. They're very upset. You see, sometimes demon-possessed people go through some tough times when the demons are forced to leave their bodies. Amen. Things might get a bit worse before they get better because the demons are stubborn and they don't want to leave. There are stories in the Bible about reactions of demon-possessed people when they encounter Jesus. Sometimes the demons throw the people to the ground. Demons are not comfortable in the presence of Jesus. They recognize who he is and his power over them, and they get very uncomfortable. Why? Why? Because there's no harmony, there's no cohabitation, and no coexistence with the Spirit of God and the Spirit of Satan in the same place at the same time. The demons are about to have a confrontation with Jesus and now conflict has risen in the man. Conflict. Because you see, wherever and whenever Jesus shows up, guess what? There's always drama. You know that? There's always drama. That's why it is impossible for you to serve both God and Satan at the same time. They both cannot coexist in the same heart, in the same house, at the same time. Not only that, they have different goals which conflict with one another. That is why you must make a choice between which one you will serve. There is no shortcut. No middle ground, no room for neutrality where Jesus is concerned. Besides, with Jesus, you must make a decision. And remember, even if you make no decision for Jesus, rest assured you have unknowingly made a decision for Satan. Because an indecision for Christ is a decision for the devil. So you see, you are going to do the will of one or the other. If you're not living for Christ, you're living for the devil. And that's keeping it real, church. That's keeping it real. Someone, verse 9 through 10. Now, when you look at the interchange between Jesus and this man, you wonder whether it is the man, a demon, or several demons speaking. One time it says, he said, another time, we said. Jesus asked the question. He asked the question, what is your name? Notice the response. It was not, my name is Jim, Butch, or Ralph. Huh? It says, my name is Legion. Because there are many of us inside this man. Jesus didn't ask for a group name. But he got a collective answer. My name is Legion. Because we are many. In other words, the man was controlled by the spiritual realm of demons. He could not recite his own identity because the demon stole it. Talk about identity theft. Mm -hmm. 
So he was what the demons declared him to be. He was acting out a renaming, and it's like people who go to Alcoholics Anonymous, you see, and they teach you to say, my, uh, my name is Ralph and I am an alcoholic, or my name is Ruth and I am a prostitute, or my name is Butch and I'm a drug addict. What they do is name you according to your addiction or the illness that controls you. Now in biblical times, the word legion meant the largest unit of the Roman military, which was about 3,000 to 6,000 soldiers. However, the Encarta Dictionary defines the word legion as a large number of people or things. So for the purpose of this story, let's just say there were 2,000 demons inside this man. One demon is bad enough, but 2,000? Man, you got some major problems. And you will see later what you will see later why I selected the number two thousand. Keep that number in your head. You see, listen to this carefully now. Two thousand demons, major problem. But listen to this. It's one thing to see a roach in your house. see just one, it's a problem. Yes. You can say, well, it's not in. Hmm? But if you see a legion of roaches, man, you're in big trouble. With one roach, red will do. But with an invasion of roaches, you need the orchid man. Because if these things are showing up in different rooms and coming out for nightly visits, Ray can't help you. Not at all. You need a pro. Yes. That's right. Demon possession is not about encountering a problem today and then it's gone by tomorrow. Uh-uh. Demons don't, they don't drop by, they don't, they don't just drop by for visits. Okay? They are looking for homes. That's right. They want to set up shop in your life just as soon as you give them an opportunity. And you do that just, and you, and you do just that when you disobey God by your bad habits, your bad attitude, your bad temper, your gossiping, your rudeness, your misconduct your addictions, your racial prejudice, your backstabbing, or any type of lifestyle that is offensive to God. Some of you don't even know that you're living for Satan. You do it unknowingly, just by your bad habits. Something about this man's lifestyle opened the portal for demonic invasion, and before you know it, he was infested with an entire family of evil spirits living inside him. It's like you invite someone to stay with you, then they want to bring their relatives. <laughs> and what some people don't know is this. When they unknowingly give a public invitation to demons, the demons, they readily accept them. They say, hey, we are legion. This is an army up in here, and we have set up shop. Yeah. The other thing about a legion is that they operate in unison. They march in sync with one another. We are a legion. We march to the beat of the same drum. <coughs> you see, brothers and sisters, the devil will always seek to cause this unity in your lives and in your church. He knows that if he's successful at doing that, he can stifle God's purpose in your life. He and his demons operate in unity, and they will open, they will spend rather, a lot of time, a lot of time, trying to keep you separated from God and continually distract you with other things. Satan knows that God does his work in the context of unity. 
That's why the Bible says so much about unity among the brethren and in marriage. Malachi 2.15 says, a husband and wife are united in one spirit, which implies there should be unity. So brothers and sisters, this unity in your home will cause your prayers to be hindered. 1 Peter 3 implies that the husband's prayers are hindered when he's disrespectful and inconsiderate to his wife. But the same thing also applies to the wife. But that is why the devil is so powerful. Because his angels work as one legion. They work in unison and march to the beat of the same drum. And so this man is totally controlled by demons. Verse 9 through 13, someone. Verse 9 through 13. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently, violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. Now you know where I got the number 2,000 as a legion. There were 2,000 pigs on the hill grazing. One demon per pig. Apparently 2,000 demons inside this man. No wonder he was so messed up. He's got 2,000 evil militant spirits telling him what to do. They're telling him he can't make it. They're telling him he is out of control. They're telling him to live in a cemetery. They are telling him to hurt himself. They are telling him to walk around naked. They are telling him to hurt people. They are controlling him and stealing his identity. Yes, he's out of his mind, but not because he had a mental breakdown, but because he's invaded by demons. So if you have a mental breakdown, also if a mental breakdown rather is caused by demonic invasion, medicine won't solve your problem. It will just camouflage. Right. This man had a spiritual issue of uncleanness that had to be addressed spiritually. By the way, a little sidebar from verse 10. Then the evil spirits begged Jesus again and again not to send them in some distant place. That should tell you something about the limitations of the devil and demons. They had to ask Jesus permission, which means the devil does not have the final say-so on your life. Amen. There is hope. He does not know everything. He cannot read your mind. But, 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 but why did the demons want to go into the pigs? Why? Why did they choose the pigs to go into? Huh? Okay. Well, let me give you two reasons. First, demons are spirits and invisible beings. So anything they do in the physical realm will require a host body in which to operate. That's the first reason. Second reason is they must have a vehicle, whether human or animal, through which they can express themselves. The demons wanted to go into the pigs. First of all, demons in, the, uh, uh, demons in the Bible are referred to as what? Unclean animals. I'm sorry, pigs. Pigs in the Bible are referred to as unclean animals. All right? Demons are unclean beings. They are unclean beings. So they are right at home living inside the pigs. You see? But demons are also at home in unclean places. They're also at home in people with messed up lives. 
Now when Jesus drove the demons out of this man, they went into the pigs. The pigs ran down the steep hillside into the lake and drowned. Because you see, when demons take over, you are going down. Amen. That's right. You understand that? Yes, You're going down. Whenever you see the continuous decline of a person's life, it is quite possible that demonic infiltration is present. Their lifestyle takes a nosedive or a downward spiral into most sinful and wicked activities. Paul says, as Christians, life is not supposed to be that way. He says, while my outward man is decaying daily, my inward man is being renewed. I'm getting older, but I'm going up. That's right. You get that? So how was this man finally delivered? He got delivered because he dragged his demons to Jesus. Mm. Amen. And he bowed. It's the bowing that is the key because the bowing means he has surrendered all authority to Jesus and yielded to him. Amen. You understand that? Jesus bids us all in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come to me. All of you are weary and have heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The man bowing is indicative of what? Total surrender. He yielded all authority of his life to Jesus. He placed his life under God's control, and since Jesus has authority over Satan and his demonic forces, the demons could not call the final shot on this man's life. If you ever felt bound by your present circumstances and you can't seem to rise above them, if you feel that the devil's got a stronghold in your life and you just can't break free, it's time to ask yourself, have I truly bowed down to Jesus? It's not about your being religious or going to church. The question on the floor is whether or not you have bowed to Jesus. Have you truly surrendered your life and everything to his authority? This man bowed to Jesus and all of a sudden the demons had to find a new place to live. Because it is not possible for the spirit of God and the spirit of Satan to reside in the same place at the same time. Now it gets even more interesting. Verse 14 through 16, someone. They that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what was. They they went out to see what it was that was done, and they came to Jesus, and see him that was possessed with the devil, and had the legion sitting and clothed in his and in his right mind, and they were afraid. <laughs> And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed with the devil and also concerning the swine. Ha! Huh. So the herdsmen fled to the nearby town and the surrounding countryside and they were spreading this news as they ran and, and, and people rushed out to see what was happening. And, and this, crowd, this crowd gathered around Jesus and, and they saw this man who had been possessed by the legion of demons. He was sitting there fully clothed and perfectly sane. And they were all afraid. <laughs> They're afraid of a sane man. <laughs> then those who had seen what happened, they told others about this demon-possessed man in the pigs. So the word gets out, the word gets out about Jesus healing the demonia. The people are saying, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yesterday this guy was naked and acting like a maniac. Now he's fully clothed, sitting calmly, and in his right mind, what happened? What happened? Well, what happened was God miraculously intervened 
and the man was instantly healed. Immediately, everything changed for this man. His lifestyle changed. Demon possession was gone. The man was transformed. But now, listen to what verse 17 says. Somebody read that. Verse 17. And they began to pray him to depart on their coast. <laughs> Would you believe that? And the crowd began pleading with Jesus to go away and leave them alone. Would you believe that? That's unbelievable. How could they say that? Here these people have a testimony by eyewitnesses. Everybody knew this man was crazy because he lived in the cemetery. He was demon possessed. And now he's in his right mind. The demons went into the pigs, the pigs plunged into the lake and drowned. Then the people said, get Jesus out of here. Huh? Get Jesus out of here. You would think they would say instead, man, if, 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 if Jesus can help someone like that, let's keep him here with us. But no, they wanted him gone. Get him out of here. Get him out of here. Why? These were farmers raising pigs. And when they lost their pigs, they lost a lot of money. A whole lot of money. 2,000 pigs grazing is not just about hogs grazing. You hear me? 2,000 hogs is a very large herd. And in today's economy, their monetary value could be easily be thousands of dollars or more, which was a sizable loss for the farmers. So economics played a big factor for these big farmers. You see, that's their pork chop. <laughs> that's their ham hocks. That's their pig feet. <laughs> That's their ham. That's bacon. That's ribs. That's your grocery store and your down home cooking. That is your soul food restaurant. Same people who are living. Let me say something to you. A lot of people today don't want some problem solved. Because you see, you can get so comfortable being defeated that you assume defeat is what it is supposed to be. Get him out of here. Because we may not have liked this crazy man. But you see, we had 2,000 pigs. And each one of those pigs could bring in so much money. Jesus is messing with our lifestyle. Get him out of here. Now we've had a comeback. The comeback is, this man had been written off by society. In, in the society in which he lived. And now he's transformed. The man is seated there in his right mind. He's clothed, talking like he has some sense. And all these people could think about were their pigs and how much money they lost. You know, it's sad but so true. Financial gain has often been prioritized above the cause of people who are in need. Very true. Throughout history, most wars have been fought to protect economic interests. At home and abroad, much of the injustice has been the direct result of some individual or a company's urge to get rich. People are continually being sacrificed to the God of money. Get Jesus out of here. 
The townspeople blame Jesus for the loss of the pigs. But Jesus was not responsible for that. He's not responsible for the loss of the pigs. Jesus ordered the demons to go into the pigs, yes. But he did not direct the action of the demons to run the pigs into the sea. It was the demons who destroyed the pigs which upset the farmers and their finances. But of course, the pig farmers didn't see it that way. It was the evil intent of the demons. You see, if they could not destroy the man, they would destroy the pigs. That was the evil intent. The evil actions prove their destructive intent. Remember what I said earlier. Whenever and wherever Jesus shows up, there's always drama. Friends, it's a sad state of affairs when people turn the Savior away because they cherish the temporal things of this world rather than the everlasting gifts of God. Jesus will not stay where he is not wanted. Remember that. He said he stands at the door and, and if you hear his voice and open the door, he will come in. But he will not force an invitation or stay where he's not wanted. A lot of people in this world today will not see Jesus because he knows where he is not welcome. He was not well re received in that region. His presence there was blamed for financial loss, even though it meant liberation for the demoniac. Someone, verse 18. And when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Ah, as Jesus was getting into the boat now, the man who had been demon possessed begged to go with him. Why is Jesus leaving the area? Exactly. That's right, because remember, get him out of here. Jesus is about to leave the man, to leave rather, Jesus is about to leave, and the man wanted to go with him. The man is saying in so many words, Jesus, I'm going with you. My people may not want you, but I do. I know where I was and how I got over. And I want to go with you. But well, watch what happens in verse 19. Somebody. Somebody read verse 19. How be it when Jesus, how be it Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. Mm. Jesus' response here tells us that the man's demonic possession was due to a sin problem that resulted in him becoming a demoniac. But Jesus reminded him, the Lord was merciful to you. Now the last time I checked, mercy is not getting what you deserve. Isn't that right? The demoniac deserved to be crazy. He deserved to be an outcast. But God had mercy on him and didn't give him what he and every sinner deserves. Mercy focuses on the individual situation and then forgives. Sin is transgression and rebellion against God. The wages of sin is what? Death. When we transgress, we rebel against God and deserve death. There are consequences for our actions. Just as we deserve and receive consequences for our actions, this man's demon possession was the consequence for his sins. But you see, God is merciful and does not always treat us as we deserve. He intervened with mercy towards this man, removed the sin consequence, and granted him new life. In Exodus 33, 19, and Romans 9, 15, God says this, 
I will show mercy and compassion in whom I choose. God gave his son Jesus to die in our place so that through him we may receive mercy and new life in Christ rather than what we really deserve, which is death. This man wanted to go with Jesus, but in so many words, Jesus told him, no, don't come with me right now. I know you want to be with me, but I have a ministry for you right here. I know you were once messed up, but I want you to go back home. I know that the hardest place for you to go right now, I know that it's the hardest place for you to go right now with all that has happened. And people there may not know what to think about you. Nevertheless, you go home and tell everyone what the Lord has done for you. This man had only an elementary understanding of Christian theology. But Jesus does not send him to seminary or to a training course in witnessing. Instead, he instructed the man to tell others what God had done for him. So wait a minute. Now the man is saying, there's a you want me to go home before I go to seminary? <laughs> you want me to go home before I go to Bible college? You want me to go home before I learn all the books of the Bible and how to explain the scriptures? <laughs> well, Jesus says, in so many words, you may not know a lot of theology, but you do know that once you were lost, and now you found. Amen. Blind, and now you can see. God has been good to you because your mind has been restored. So yes, you go home and tell the people there just how merciful the Lord has been. Someone read verse 20 for me, please. When he departed and began to publish in Decapolis, how great things he did in Jerusalem. Then Jesus said to him, and all men did marvel. Ah, so the man started off to visit to ten towns of that region and began to proclaim great things that Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed at what he told him. Now that's called a testimony. You hear me? Jesus told the man to go where? Go home. But where did he go instead? The man went to Decapolis. The Greek word for Decapolis means 10 towns or 10 cities. The man didn't go home. He went to a 10 city region and told the entire metroplex what Jesus has done for him. So on Sunday, he went to Beach Grove. Monday, he went to Lawrence. Tuesday, he went to Terry Hall. Wednesday, he went to Gary. Thursday, he went to Franklin. Friday, he went to Nineveh. Saturday, he went to Bloomington. Then he went to Brownsburg. Next, he went to Carmel. Then he wrapped it up in Indianapolis. Hmm? He went to the whole region because, you see, when you've been that bad off and the Lord has been good to you, you just can't keep it to yourself. When you've made a comeback from a setback, you've got to talk about it. I was lost, but now I'm found. Blind, but now I see. If God has done something for you, somebody ought to know about it. If you are hell bound and now you're heaven bound, tell somebody about it. If you don't have a job and God gave you one, tell somebody about it. If you couldn't pay your bills and he provided a way, tell somebody about it. If you've lost your mind and God has restored it, tell somebody about it. If you were in prison and God has provided for an early release, Tell somebody about it. Right. You should not be ashamed to say it was Jesus. Right. Amen. Paul said, I'm not ashamed to tell who's been good to me. You see, every child of God should grow in the knowledge of who God is and what he has done for them. The truth is, God has done something for each and every one of you sitting in here today. Because, as I've always said, Every time you're awakened to see a brand new day, that's right. and your name is not in the obituary, obituary that's a blessing. That's right. Amen? Amen. Yes. Many people did not awaken to see this day, but you did. God, your creator, wants you to get to know him. 
He wants to fellowship with you and grow you in your knowledge of him. But when you fail to do that, you insult the Lord who gave you gifts and abilities. So you see, you have much to thank God for. If you have experienced the power of God in your life, be enthusiastic about it. Just as you're willing to tell others how you were healed of a physical ailment, you should be just as willing to tell others how Jesus saved you from your sins. Your central witness is your own story, so tell it. The impact of God on your life is your most effective witness, so share it. Tell the world how God brought you from your setback to a comeback. I never like to close my sermon without giving an opportunity for someone to, to invite someone to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He's knocking at your heart's door right now, but the, the question is, are you listening? Will you let him come in? Or like the pig farmers, will you chase him away? Decide, decide now, and you, 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 you have to make a decision sooner or later. Whether or not you will serve Jesus, your creator, or Satan, the instigator. This is a matter of life and death, people. A matter of your soul salvation. A matter of where you will spend eternity. If you're tired of carrying those heavy burdens alone, if you want to make things right with the Lord, or if you have drifted away from him, I encourage you now to ask Jesus Christ into your life as your personal savior, because today is your opportunity for a comeback. Amen. Like the demoniac in the story, <clears throat> most of society today is screaming at God, they're screaming at the church, and they're screaming at Christian values, and they're saying, why are you interfering with me? Get out of my life. <laughs> it's a scream of fear. It's a scream of defense. It's a scream of rebellion against God. No one today would want to admit that they're demon-possessed. But when people reject Jesus Christ and his authority, they put themselves on the sides of demons and at the mercy of demons, outside God's protection, and open the door for demon possession. It's an opportunity demons are waiting for. You see, sooner or later, everyone here, sitting here today, and the rest of the world must ask themselves this question. Will I choose Christ? Will I choose his loving leadership? Will I choose his forgiveness? Will I choose his healing? Will I choose his cleansing? Will I cho choose true freedom in my life? Or will I choose self-rule, self-sufficiency, self-will, and self-determination? which will lead me to destruction. Your response to this invitation, my brethren, will determine your eternal destiny. What do you say today then? Will it be Jesus or will it be Satan? Will your response be your setback or your comeback? Remember, an indecision for Christ is a decision for the devil. Will you make a decision for Christ today? If you will, meet us up front as we sing our closing song. Why do I ask people to meet us up front? Because it was Jesus himself who said, Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will deny before my Father in heaven. Come to the mercy seat while mercy is still available to you. Because you see, once Jesus leaves that mercy seat in heaven, there will be no more mercy available. Probation will be closed for everyone. And so the question I ask of you again, do you really want to put him off again? Can you afford to put him off again? Can you?
Can you afford to tell Jesus, not today, tomorrow? Can you afford that? Wow. If you're willing, if Jesus is speaking at your heart's door, if he's knocking on that heart's door of yours today, please come forward.